Welcome into the Ether, a podcast brought to you by ETHUB, the essential source for Ethereum information. Don't let DeFi interest rate volatility hold you back. Notional Finance is the only fixed rate protocol on Ethereum where you can lock in your rates for up to one year, whether you're a borrower or a lender. Serving both sides of the market means that you can leverage up your crypto portfolio or build a fixed rate income stream on your assets. And thanks to Notional's deep liquidity, you can exit your position early at the current market rate if you want. With V2 liquidity mining, LPs earn note incentives, liquidity fees, and interest on deposits of USDC, DAI, ETH, or wrapped Bitcoin. Notional Finance, stability and certainty, now available in your crypto portfolio. Head over to notional.finance to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ETHUB Weekly Recap. In these episodes, we discuss the latest news from the Ethereum ecosystem and crypto space as a whole. This week, we are covering the news from February 21st to March 13th, 2022. Hey, Anthony, want to walk us through the news? Hey, Eric. Yeah, so we're back after a three-week hiatus, I think it is. Uh, Sorry about that, guys. Uh, We're not (laughs) kind of like trying to rug you or canceling the podcast or anything like that. It's just that scheduling uh, is, is, is a lot harder these days. We're both quite busy um you know much busier than we than we have been in the past so uh we still try to do it whenever whenever we can uh we still try to do it weekly if we can but yeah sometimes it just kind of like ends up like that so apologies i know you guys are definitely hungry for for these uh for these episodes and it's it's, it's humbling to know that you guys are, you know i guess i got pinged on, on twitter a few times about it that you guys you know miss miss the podcast so so that's 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 really awesome but yeah we're back now we've got a ton to get through over the last three weeks so you know the funny thing is i was i was kind of going through the newsletters before and I realized that uh, the last time we did a podcast was before the Russia invaded Ukraine. So before this whole thing started, uh, which is actually crazy to think about that it has only been going on for a few weeks, but it feels like it's been going on forever. So I guess we can talk a little bit about that and like how that affects crypto more generally and, and just like the, the, the macro markets and stuff like that. So I guess, you know, everyone knows by now that Russia decided to invade Ukraine. Um, it, it seems like they uh, got more than they bargained for. It seems like they didn't realize how much resistance they would face in Ukraine and the war has has dragged on longer than I think that they, they would have liked. Obviously, there's been a lot of sanctions going on. Uh, you know, basically the whole world is sanctioning Russia at this point and, you know, condemning their invasion because, I mean, it's an unprovoked invasion, right? Uh, so obviously, you know, you and I, Eric, uh, I, I think, you know, I mean, you and I, we, we, we kind of like stand behind Ukraine here. We think that it's just like a completely pointless war. But I guess what it means for the wider markets, it seems crypto has kind of like shrugged this off. I don't think crypto has really taken a hit from from this sort of stuff. Obviously, crypto was already in a bit of a downtrend. There was uh, there was the stuff around the Fed rate hikes and, and obviously, you know, high inflation right now. And I think inflation... The CPI print is going to come in higher than it ever has before. The next one uh, for, for the US and, and for other countries around the world, uh, obviously, you know, gas is getting more expensive because of the fact that uh, Russia supplies a lot of the the, the, current, the, the world's gas right now and, and, and oil and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, the macroeconomic markets are in a bit of a in a bit of a shit spot. But crypto seems to be holding up really, really well, uh, considering, right? I mean, ETH is still at time of recording about 2600 Look, I mean, you know, there is a kind of like bottom on the charts at about 1700 where ETH tested it a few times, you know, last year and then kind of like uh, has, has gone back to the lower 2000s. But I don't know, I'm quite surprised by how, how well crypto is holding up. And I kind of have this thesis that crypto markets, because they're 24-7, because they're a lot more active, they seem to price things in a lot quicker than the traditional markets will, for example. But in saying that, some of the traditional markets, such as a lot of the stocks that pumped for no reason last year, are actually down massively. And, you know, they're down as much as a lot of crypto uh, currencies are down. And if you go look at the, especially the tech stocks that got overvalued there, and the meme stocks, they're down massively. And I think that was obviously due to, uh, you know, the money printing was a, was a big factor there. And now the money printing is coming back to, to buy people in the ass because like everything else is, is, is kind of going up, right? Cost of living is skyrocketing. Obviously, people need to kind of like cover their basic bills and, and, and mortgage and all that sort of stuff. And uh, they don't have spare capital to throw into crypto. But that doesn't mean that, that crypto is not going to go up from here. Like I'm, I'm still pretty bullish on ETH, obviously leading up to the merge, you know, uh, I'm pretty bullish. But I guess when looking at the whole macro environment right now, it's a very weird place to be. There's a lot of precedents being set, a lot of things kind of like happening for the for the first time. And uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm just pretty pretty surprised by how well ETH has held up during all of this. Uh, but yeah, Eric, I'm curious for your thoughts around this because we haven't actually spoken in a few weeks. So curious to, to see your thoughts around kind of like this whole conflict and everything in between. 
Yeah, I think the important takeaway is kind of what you wrapped up there. Like, <clears throat> we and we've said this a lot, you know, short term zoomed in on graphs, like fundamentals don't necessarily matter, right? There's like a lot of different things. Either it's just like general FUD in the crypto market or macro environment headwinds or tailwinds, right? And I think over the last, you know, six months or so, not only has crypto just been cooling off from a pretty epic rise, um, there's also been a lot of macro headwinds. So we've had like inflation scares, you know, we had like kind of the Omicron COVID wave, um, and now we have the Russia-Ukraine crisis, right? So, you know, in general, it's pretty amazing to me that he's consolidating and holding in this 2,500 level. Of course, I find that funny because that's like the number that got memed, right? From me saying, I thought that would be the cycle top on Bankless like months back, or I guess over a year now, probably that podcast came out. But it's kind of a funny number. Like this kind of became a consolidation area for ETH and it's been memes so much. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, markets have pretty, like they're emotional, right? So kind of like leading into the conflict and early on, volatility is insane. I think we're starting to see volatility, especially the VIX um, on the stock side start to start to slow down a little bit. Um, but I mean, in general, like cryptos face some of these big macro headwinds and held up pretty well. Like that's bullish to me personally. Like I, I don't know. I, after seeing even before this, you know, this war that broke out, I mean, I, was pretty decently bullish on the ETH consolidation happening while a lot of people on Twitter and elsewhere have just been screaming bear. Like this is this is not a bear market. Look, we were like, what, 14 months ago or something like that, we were at $300, we're at 2,500. Like that, that's just not a bear market. This is consolidation if you look at the charts, right? And this is a pretty good level to just kind of chill out for a while. So I, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm personally decently bullish moving forward. I think, you know, consolidation just has to happen. But the fact that I think the biggest drawdown we've had so far, I believe is like 55, 60% maybe we hit. I mean, that's, that's like nothing compared to the 94% we saw, you know, three years ago. Yeah, kind of when you contextualize it like that, it's actually kind of amazing, right? Where we, I mean... In 2018, we went down 94% in 11 months or something like that. I think it was from all time high to to the low there for that year. Um, and you know, since the all time high now, it's been quite a few months. I mean, the all time high was set in November. It's now March, right? Uh, you know, we could obviously we can still go lower from here, everyone. Like, I'm not saying that it's guaranteed that we're gonna you know go up from here or just continue sideways. We could we could definitely keep going down. Um, but currently, we're down around. You know, less than 50% from, from all time high, which is pretty good considering, you know, crypto's kind of volatility and considering what every, most other things are down. Like a lot of things are down 90 plus percent from their all time highs against USD and even more against ETH there. So yeah, it's, it's been quite, quite kind of like uh, interesting to see that. I mean, you, you, you kind of like count the months, right? November, December, January, February, we're in our fifth month now. Uh, obviously, you know, there's still time to, to keep going down, but if we, we, we kind of like uptrend from here, it's definitely going to break a lot of precedence. That's for sure. I think this market cycle has definitely already been different to most other ones or I guess pretty much all the other ones um, and if we kind of like start going up again from here it definitely uh, breaks the precedent yet again of kind of like that long-term bear market the two-year consolidation kind of period uh, which I think would be even more bullish and signal to the market that this asset class is maturing a lot uh, and, and there is definitely a lot of organic demand there for these sorts of things especially ETH I mean as I said we're coming up on the merge here in, in, in hopefully June we're going to talk about the merge a little bit more later but i guess especially leading up to that with 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 kind of everything surrounding that and just like everything going with with ethereum with l2s and stuff I don't know. It's just, for me personally, it's very, very hard to be bearish. I can't actually think of a bear case for ETH in a vacuum. Obviously, I can think of a bear case for markets in general, given you know everything we just talked about. But for ETH itself, I, I cannot think of any sort of bear case outside of the merge failing, which in my mind is like a near 0% chance at, at this point. Given everything that I've seen, given all the care and time that has been taken to get this right, I, I feel like it's all going to go well. Uh, but we'll have to see how that plays out. As I said, talk about the merge a little bit later. Um, and I guess finally here, I just wanted to quickly shout out the Gitcoin grants round 13 the matching round 13 is now live It'll be live for I think another week and a half still so definitely go donate to all of your favorite projects on there obviously ethub is on there donations are appreciated but not required uh, but yeah just wanted to kind of give a quick shout out there 
All right, on to the project updates from the last three weeks. So I think one of the biggest updates was uh, out of ZK Sync, who announced that their ZK EVM testnet is now live. So this is the first ZK EVM, uh, I guess, like implementation to be live on a testnet. Obviously, very, very big news there. Uh, there's more of these ZK EVMs coming from other teams that are working on them, such as Polygon and Scroll. Uh, and this is obviously considered the holy grail of Ethereum scaling, right? We have uh, EVM compatible optimistic rollups, which have been much easier to roll out and they're live. Arbitrum Optimism are doing really well. They're growing. You know, everyone loves them. Uh, but the ZKVM stuff, uh, you know, I, I think is going to take a little bit longer. I don't think that uh, the, the, it's going to come as quickly as people think it will. I think, you know, it being on testnet is all well and good. But there, there are different ways to do ZKVM stuff. And, and, and you know, proving ZK stuff is still computationally expensive. That The cost for that need to come down. The hardware needs to get better there. So I still think we're a little while away before we get kind of like equivalent uh, to what we have with optimistic rollups and optimistic rollups are just going to get better over time as well. And I think pretty much the, um, the, the main drawbacks of optimistic rollups that people kind of like uh, quoted for such a long time are pretty much moot at this point. I mean, everyone was saying, oh, there's a seven day withdrawal period. Well, I mean, we have all these bridges now, you know, yes, there's increased risk there, but we have all these bridges that allow for withdrawals within a few minutes. Right. Uh, and, and the costs are coming down over time. We're going to talk a bit about that as well um, today. But yeah, I, I just think it's awesome to see that a ZKVM is actually live on testnet. But at the same time, I think people need to take into context uh, kind of the, the fact that this stuff is still quite far away from being, you know, equivalent to where we are with the optimistic rollup stuff because that's what we want it to be. We want it to be, you know, EVM compatible ZK rollup. But, uh, you know, it's still a little while away there. And as I said, there are different implementations, uh, ZK Sync, Polygon and Scroll. I mean, Polygon has three ZK teams, but they're all kind of like working on different implementations of like a ZK EVM uh, in, in the kind of like way that they think is best. And as I said, it, it does depend a lot on hardware too, because these proving costs can be quite high and, and the uh, computation for them can be quite intensive and take a while. There's work being done there on kind of maybe having ASICs for this sort of stuff. So it's all kind of like happening, but I think, you know, people that think that it's going to happen like tomorrow, no, it's, it's still going to be a little while here. And, and uh, I, I think we should use what we have today, definitely. And I don't think these things obsolete optimistic rollups either, uh, but we'll We'll talk about that a bit later, but uh, Eric, you get very exciting here with this, you know, first ZKVM on testnet. Yeah, it's great to see. And I mean, I definitely echo your sentiments. Like all of this stuff is launching and, you know, especially like on the Arbitrum and Polygon optimism side, like you can go use it. And I do pretty much on a daily basis, but you know, this is still on testnet here, but like in the long run, there's still a lot of work to be done on all of these solutions. And this is, I mean, like, just like ETH has been like, gosh, we're getting up on like almost 10 years, eight years or whatever. So like a multi-decade play, I've used that term a lot. Like layer two is absolutely that too, right? Like these things aren't just going to launch and then they're done. We're seeing a space race, I guess I'll call it, <laughs> on the layer two side. And these teams will get competitive. They're all going to be launching features to try and one up another. And as a user, this is wonderful, right? But like these implementations we're getting early on are not the final states. And I think that's very important to remember. And because of that, it's important to have patience. And also, you know, even if you're using like optimism stuff today, there still are some risk factors. Like you mentioned bridges. Um, there's still like centralization vectors. A lot of these teams haven't like fully turned over the keys yet, as you want to, as just, I guess you could say to the chains. Um, you know, so you got to take that all into consideration. But yeah, getting a ZK EVM is, is massive. And it's funny because like kind of on that, no, like I see a lot of just like only talk about what people are using that day. Like, oh, optimism is layer two or like, oh, you know, or we have Polygon as an option for this bridge or blah, blah, blah. Like people don't even realize how much more stuff's still coming down the road, right? Like I barely even saw much talk about ZK Sync for like months after, you know, optimism kind of went live and Arbitrum's out there of course. And so, I mean, I, I think it's going to blow people away how much brain power research and building is still coming to the layer two side. And it just, I mean, to echo your market sentiments, it's just sure the market could be irrational and turned down, but like as a user and an investor, truly understanding what's going on in the long-term roadmap of ETH, like it's just impossible to be bearish with all this layer two stuff. 
Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I've, I've asked for a few months now for someone to give me a actual bear thesis on ETH, like as in a vacuum, I'm not talking about the wider kind of like macro environment and all that sort of stuff that obviously affects ETH. I'm talking about literally bear case on ETH and Ethereum. No one has been able to give me a good one. I mean, some people tried to say, oh, well, the merge could fail and that would be really bad. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, worst case scenario, the merge fails and we just do it again, right? And obviously that's, it's going to be really bad, but it's not like it's a showstopper for Ethereum or it, you know, it results in like a, an uber bearish outlook for Ethereum or anything like that. So it's always funny to see that, um, you know, my, my get, get, you know, challenge your assumptions and, and kind of like realize that, yeah, okay, there's no real reason to be bearish on Ethereum and, and ETH right now. All right, on to the next update. So Diversify and Opera, the, the browser, have teamed up uh, with an integration here. So for those of you who don't know, Opera, I mean, it was a more popular browser in the past, but they still have, as far as I can tell, hundreds of millions of users. So this is actually a quite a large integration for Diversify, which for those who don't know, is a layer two DeFi platform. Uh, they're kind of like a Validium using StarQuest technology. So uh, they, they, they've kind of like teamed up to enable uh, Opera users to basically use these layer two, this layer two DeFi platform on Diversify doing swaps and all that sort of stuff, sending kind of like uh, currencies to each other and, and, and all that stuff there. So very, very cool to see this. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you want to see for... I guess like mass adoption, right? We've talked about this a lot in the past, how we don't think that mass adoption is going to happen through people uh, kind of like having to install a MetaMask, uh, a, a client and stuff like that, or having to kind of like uh, install this new software and, and learn all these new things. There'll be some of that, but I think most people will be using DeFi and crypto through kind of like uh, these, these third party apps like Opera, for example, um, you know, centralized exchanges, stuff like that. And the, 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 the main kind of like, uh, I guess, selling point of for, for me for these sorts of things in crypto is that you have a choice, right? Like you can either go through the centralized intermediary or you can go through some really easy to use integration that, you know, you may not have kind of like total control over everything, but it's just seamless and easy to use. Or you can do it all the, the I guess, like the hard way, right? Or the, the more difficult way because you want to basically be self-sovereign. You want to be truly bankless. And I think that is definitely the, the main draw here, but also the fact that DeFi just gives us much more than the traditional finance gives us, right? It gives us the transparency, gives us the efficiency, gives us the, the, the scale, um, gives us that global sediment layer in Ethereum that we that we just don't have in the TradFi world. So I think when you when you kind of like holistically look at the picture of how mass adoption will happen, these sorts of things that, you know, with, with Diversify and Opera teaming up is is definitely needed. Even if it's not you know, the true decentralized bankless self-sovereign vision that we all want to see. It's uh, unfortunately, you know, if you look at kind of like humanity as a whole and, and the way the internet was adopted, especially, you're not going to get everyone doing everything, you know, in, in, in kind of like the hard way. Most people want the easy way. They have other stuff going on in their lives and that's totally fine. But uh, I, I think just having the choice has always been the bull case for me when it comes to this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. Like Opera, I mean, I haven't used them as a browser for a while, but they've always been pretty bullish on ethereum and integrating like wallets and stuff like that and it's cool to see direct integration of you know a layer two app like this um you know diversify has been around for a while um we've even had them on the podcast back in the day and and just yeah this is absolutely the future right like there's just and i mean we've talked about this for years and we just knew it would take a while to get there but just direct on-ramping of people to layer two without them having to even understand the difference in layer one and layer two um, is the way forward. And why that matters on Ethereum is like you do get, now we just talked about not, we're not there yet, but you do get layer one security. Let, let me back up. You do get layer one security assumptions for layer two transactions. There's just some risk, some centralization vectors as of right now um, on some of these layer twos that will go away. But let's talk a little bit in the future from now when those are gone, I mean, users just will get on ramp directly onto a layer two Ethereum app and be like, oh, this is great. It's instant. I only need like a couple cents in my wallet to do these transactions. And, you know, th those users don't want to have to worry about like layer one versus layer two and bridges and stuff like that. Right. And I think we'll really see this ushered in on on the wallet side um, and, you know, of course on the exchange side as well, but exchanges, well, they all have their own wallets it seems these days, but you know, the exchanges will kind of be there. They'll have like a bunch of funds on layer two. So it's costless for the user to say, Hey, I want to exit on layer two. Um, even at that point, let's say like way in the future, it's probably going to be like 
they're probably even going to frame it as like, do you want to go on like fast Ethereum or slow Ethereum or something like that, right? I can see that happening. Um, but the, just direct onboarding into wallets on layer two. And then, you know, people don't have to worry about $20, $30 transaction fees, you know, slower block times and stuff like that. So we're getting there. It's going to take a while. And I think it's going to be fairly fragmented for a bit. But eventually, this is all just going to be hidden by the user experience on these wallets. Yeah, yeah, I think so, definitely. And that that is definitely the path right there. And I think that's what a lot of people realize is that the wallets are a really great kind of like front end, uh, especially mobile wallets, and especially the ones who just simplify all of this and do one-click uh, stuff. We're going to talk a bit about Argent at the end of the podcast here and, and what they do. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I think this is the, the the path forward. I think just having the choice is is kind of like the bull case for DeFi. And I'm curious to see how, you know, mass adoption is achieved. Like uh, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe, maybe people will kind of like go that extra mile but uh, we'll have to see how it all plays out. All right, so a big announcement out of Arbitrum over the last couple of weeks. They announced something called Any Trust Chains, which is basically Arbitrum's answer to a Validium or I guess to an Avalanche subnet or I guess to like spin them up your own chain sort of thing. So essentially, I guess like uh, the, the the way kind of like Any Trust works or Any Trust Chains work is that they're separate chains that, that uh, will operate alongside the Arbitrum 1 chain uh, and they're basically made to be uh, for ultra low cost transactions with still with strong security guarantees. Now, this isn't going to give you the same security guarantees as Arbitrum 1 as a true kind of like roll up on Ethereum. Uh, but what this will allow you, what the, how this works is that these kind of like any trust chains operated by a committee of nodes uh, with, with kind of like minimal, you know, assumptions about how many committee members are honest here. So similar to, I guess, like the Validium model where data is stored off chain and proofs are stored on chain here. You know, assuming that trust assumption kind of like holds and everything like that, uh, you, you get the ultra low uh, transaction fees uh, and you still get kind of relative, relatively strong security. Now, there is a fallback to roll up feature as well, where this can this kind of like any trust chain doesn't have to stay as, um, you know, with, with kind of like that, um, that com not compromised security, but kind of like less security than a roll up. It can fall back to a roll up, which I think is pretty cool. And this is kind of like what... Um, what Starco wants to do with their Validium and turn it into a Validity where you could kind of do, you know, choose if you're a roll-up or a Validium, which I think is cool. But you know, th these sorts of things, I, th I guess, are the future here when it comes to, to scaling Ethereum. There's going to be a wide range of kind of like scaling um, implementations, you know, true kind of like L2s with, as, as roll-ups or just like off-chain data or kind of like, uh, you know, these committees and stuff like that. And Polygon's actually been working on this for quite a while as well. They have a bunch of things there, but there's going to be different kind of, I guess, um, chains or different constructions that appeal to different organizations, different users and stuff like that. I mean, for example, you could have an antitrust chain that is that is kind of like running a, 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 a game, you know, a crypto game. You know, you don't need ultra high security for a crypto game, right? Whereas for something like DeFi, you definitely want that ultra high security because you're moving around a lot of funds. You want to make sure that... <clears throat> A small group of people can't steal the funds and all that sort of stuff. Whereas on, uh, I guess, like an antitrust chain, for example, you you can have that lower security for for something like a, a game because at, at the end of the day, it's it's securing much much kind of like less value than than something like Def a DeFi kind of like focused chain would. So very cool to see this. I think that. You know, Arbitrum and, and just got all the L2 teams in general are doing a lot here, you know, not just on their kind of like main implementation, obviously with, with Arbitrum 1, but, you know, obviously with any trust chains, trying to kind of like innovate, trying to provide solutions that fit all kind of market participants, not just the ones that want ultra high security, because obviously there's an appetite for the lower security stuff, right? We've seen that with the Polygon POS chain. We've seen that with some of these alt L1 EVMs. And if we can get them just, you know, keep them all in the Ethereum family, that's even better. So I, I say let's do more of this, even if it's it's less secure than a roll-up, because you definitely want those kind of like ultra cheap transactions that roll-ups will probably not be able to achieve for quite a while. And by ultra cheap, I'm talking like sub one cent transaction fees, like even less than that. Um, that's that. There's definitely a market for that, like and and a pretty big market at that. I think eventually we'll get there with rollups, uh, like probably in a few years when when all the kind of like L1 upgrades are in, when sharding is in, all that sort of stuff. But for now, we definitely need these kind of uh, other solutions so that we we can kind of keep people in Ethereum and not kind of get them migrating to other chains to to experience this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, this totally goes to what I was just kind of talking about, like the research and development here is just going to be insane over the coming years. And we're already seeing things that. That we weren't even discussing like barely a year ago. Um, and what's really interesting here is like, we're almost kind of talking about like layer three in a way, like you're, you're saying like, okay, this layer two is 
really secure, maybe we could have a little bit less trust assumptions for, like you said, like a game, right? And this is definitely going to be the way forward for this stuff. And I, I don't necessarily think like the users will pick this. It'll be the creators, right? Like the creators of that game, the developers of the app that say, okay, you know, I think most users of this app would want this much trust assumption, this much, this much, or this much. And then these apps kind of get deployed there. The users gets pushed there. Um, you know, and they might start to do some research on the different trade-offs of that stuff. But not every app, like you said, it needs like DeFi level security, right? Especially if you start getting into gaming, you start getting into like social networks in a way. Like you want those things to be hyper cheap and fast, right? You don't necessarily need like DeFi level security and assum trust assumption. So great to see. Um, again, this just goes like like these teams aren't going to stop innovating, right? This is this is an arms race on the layer two side. And like where this ends, like it it's definitely doesn't end on like everybody uses like just Arbitrum solution or everybody uses just Polygon solution. Like these teams are going to like have their own cool things about their chains, um, whatever you want to call it, layer two, layer three, layer four, however deep we end up going. Um, and like that concept of this just being stripped away from the user on like the wallet side and them just going to an app they like and not really caring where it is. Um, that's going to be, you know, the way forward. And like you mentioned earlier, these bridges, I mean, the seven day thing didn't last very long. Like I, when I come off Arbitrum, I use hot protocol and it like early on the fees were pretty high, but the pools are deep now. And it's like, very very minimal fee to take off a large sum of money like it's basically like a layer one transaction fee like that's the slippage you get um depending on like what coin you do but normally like ethan usdc it's very small um so that has that pain points already been abstracted away right through innovation so again exciting times and props to the arbitration team for you know they've got a lot on their plates but they're they already are innovating like a step forward yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, yeah, that, that, that's it, mate. It's all about the innovation at the end of the day, right? And and I think the L2 teams are innovating more than any other right now. I know DeFi is in its own little slump. I think people are trying to get away from the Ponzinomics of DeFi. Uh, but yeah, all the action seems to be right now happening in the Layer 2 space. So, so yeah. All right, on to uh, something that I'm going to let you talk a little bit about, Eric, as you're closer to this than I am. But uh, Yuga Labs, I think that's how you say it, uh, the creators of Board Ape Yacht Club, as everyone will probably know by now, has acquired uh, some punks and me bits from Lava Labs. So basically, it seems like Lava Labs is piecing out of the, I guess, NFT game. They've sold their punks and me bits and, and kind of like the rights and everything to, to Yuga Labs here. And then uh, Yuga Labs went uh, went ahead and gave it uh, gave punks and me bits the CC0 license but not in the full kind of like aspect here. They gave uh, rights uh, to owners, but not to, to uh, that, sorry, they gave full rights to owners, but not to everyone here. Now, this obviously made big waves in the NFT community. There were takes from everyone on this, you know, people people kind of like being like, oh, this is bullish, this is bearish, blah, blah, blah. I am not very close uh, to the NFT stuff. There's just too much going on there, but I know Eric, you spent a lot of time there. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your kind of like thoughts on this, you know, is it bullish, is it bearish for NFTs, punks in general? You know, what, what's your kind of like take on this? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was everybody knows punks are pretty dear to my heart. Uh, been around them for a while. And like, I was decently close to the Larva Labs people early on when the Discord just had a few people in it. And like, I think they, you know, look, they were innovators. They released a really cool product, multiple products. They did autoglyphs as well. You know, MeBits, not everybody loved. I, I personally kind of like them. They're still, they were one of the first kind of like, 3D voxel type NFTs, which I think someday will take off as the metaverse keeps growing. Um, but they just, they didn't really keep up with the community in the times, I feel like. And the push we're seeing in the NFT space, I mean, you, you explained it, but basically there's, and I'm not an expert on like licensing and IP rights by any means. So I, I could even get part of this wrong, but the big push is for CCO. So basically, Larva Labs launched CryptoPunks and you went out, you claim them, now you go out and buy them and you own your punk. But Larva Labs still own the IP to that punk. So if you wanted to say, you know, I've got my profile picture, it's my 3D glasses guy. If I wanted to go out and like create a TV show for him or create merch for them, they could technically have gone after me and sued me for that, right? Now that just feels very anti-Ethereum ethos. So the big push in the NFT space has been towards not only do you own the NFT, but you own the IP rights to that NFT. And there's like different variables of that. Um, 
the Yuga Labs for Bored Apes, from what I understand and what they for now have brought over to Punks and Mebits, is that it's essentially CCO, but like CCO, so a good example of CCO is like um, MFers, there's a few out there, like Crypto Toads, stuff like that. Um, that means like anybody has the right for any of those items. So say you own MFer 370, whatever, say it's a hoodie. Um, anybody can take that that MFR and create merch for it, create a TV show for it, create a Broadway show for it, whatever. And nobody can sue them, right? The, the rights are fully out there. Um, on the now apes, punks, Mebit side, as the owner of the punk, you can do that. But you could technically go after someone else that like used your punk, right? And like, that seems pretty fair to me. Like, I kind of get that. Um, we might, I could see it going full CCO at some point. But like, look, I'm not going to go after someone that like uses my punk. So like, I feel like at least now I own the IP rights to my punk, which feels right to me. And I think Larva Labs team never fully like met. Like, they launched it like super early, like before Ethereum really had a big community. This was like 2017, and they just they weren't really Ethereum guys. They they had created like Android games before and stuff like that. Um, they never really just fell in love with the community. I felt like, and they were kind of checked out. So I, I think. I mean, to me, I didn't expect this. Like early in the day, I'm like, why are Mebits pumping? And there were like rumors that they were going to acquire Mebits. And then that night it's like, holy crap, they bought, not only did they acquire the IP rights to Punks and Mebits, they bought almost like all of Larva Labs. So a Larva Labs started out with a thousand of the 10,000 Punks. I think they were down like 600 of them. Um, I believe they bought something like 500 Punks and like multi thousands of me bits plus the ip rights so i don't know the you know the actual price on this deal myself i don't know if it's out there yet or not i'm kind of taking a twitter hiatus right now so i could have missed it um but this was not a small deal but as as a punk holder i i'm bullish this people want these rights they want in a, on the nft side they want branding like teams and people to like kind of push branding forward and stuff they don't want just like an nft launch and it just stops there so we'll see where this goes but it's kind of cool to see you know the punks and the apes community kind of be married in a sense yeah yeah i think so i mean that kind of my view as like an nft outsider here is i like the licensing stuff but i kind of i don't know i i don't want to see like the nft space just kind of like turn into a, a few conglomerates that own everything right or that kind of like are responsible for everything obviously if they they do the licensing correctly that's all well and good but still i i feel like the magic of nfts especially you know as you were mentioning things like mfs and other stuff like that is that they're able to form kind of like uh you know their own communities without having to kind of like uh i guess you know clash with other communities or clash with other cultures right where, where things kind of like merge together but i think that's just going to be the natural kind of like path here there will be stuff like that happening but the communities can still remain separate even though there's kind of like some centralized company that that you know owns a lot of the the, the supply or something like that so it's gonna it's gonna be interesting to see how this kind of like falls out and what people think of this as time goes on all right, on to an update from Optimism. So Optimism announced, I think a couple of weeks ago, that they're going to deploy their implementation of core data compression this month. So I believe Testnet is going live in a couple of days and Mainnet should be next week. But this will lead to a 40% reduction in fees on the optimistic Ethereum network. Uh, and now, you know, a lot of you are probably aware of this, that layer two fees are in general are way down right now. I, obviously, this is influenced by layer one fees being down, you know, 20, 30 guay over the past few weeks, given that the market has been quiet. But you know, Optimism, Arbitrum, these other L2s, they're always optimizing on fees. And, and the, the biggest way for them to do that is by enabling something called core data compression, which basically allows them to do exactly as the name implies, compress the core data to take up less space on layer one Ethereum, which means they can pack more into a into their transactions and, you know, pass those kind of like savings onto users. So uh, I think at current kind of like uh, fee, fee um, uh, at fees on optimism if i just go to l2fees.info i can see that uh, a swap on optimism right now costs 42 cents and on arbitrum it's 49 cents so just a small difference there but you know if they cut that by another 40 percent you know we're getting to the to the you know 20 cent mark there and then you know throwing all the layer one upgrades coming and stuff like that in the longer term and, and any other upgrades that optimism and, and arbitrum and all these l2s do and you're going to get down to a sub 10 cent swap and that's just crazy right and this is with full ethereum security mind you this is not um skin on Ethereum security or anything like that. Now, obviously, if the way goes back to 100, which I, I think it probably will, you can basically, you know, at least three or four times those, those kind of like fees there, and you're back to pay basically maybe a 40 cent kind of thing there. But as I said, with these L1 upgrades that are coming, there are two EIPs in, in particular 
that are coming. One of them allows, uh, it kind of like reduces the cost of, of storing call data on, on the main chain. And another one uh, basically introduces a new transaction type just for L2s called blob carrying transactions. And those will get these kind of like uh, uh, optimistic roll-up transactions down to even sub five cents sort of thing. So, and, and then obviously throwing sharding and you've got yourself basically one cent and, and less transaction fees here, which is obviously, you know, amazing, right? And this is for full Ethereum security. Uh, this is not skimping on that. This is not something like a, a Validium which stores uh, data off chain or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, this is just crazy. I mean, I didn't think we'd get here this fast, to be honest, I, th I thought it would take longer, but uh, yeah, this is amazing. No longer will users have to kind of like suffer those $50 swap fees right on layer one. You'll get the same security on, on a swap as you would on Ethereum layer one by doing it at layer two, and you'll, pay, you'll be paying less than 10 cents, uh, and, and maybe even one day, one cent for these and, or less. So that's just crazy to me. I mean, we talked about layer twos for so long, so long. I mean, probably since the start of this podcast, and even before that, like just on, on Twitter and things like that. Uh, but, you know, they're here now, they work, they're working as advertised, and uh, they're getting better as time goes on. So very, very cool to see this, uh, you know, from Optimism here. Yeah, great to see. I mean, I, I've i used Optimism a little bit um, for an exchange or two over there. Um, I mainly am using Arbitrum, but uh, it's not that I'm like tied to it. It's just I've found less apps I personally use on Optimism. But um, just the fees in general are just great to see. Props to the Optimism team here. I mean, it's getting to the point where, like you said, we're getting into like maybe single digit cents eventually. Um I mean, ideally the day where we get to like sub one cent, right? That That's where it gets really awesome. I mean, it's already awesome, but for most people, I, for a lot of DeFi transactions, I mean, you're paying five, 10 cents. That's amazing for what you're actually doing, right? I mean, just in the traditional banking world, you send like a wire, it's like 25 bucks. You make like a trade, a stock trade, it's like 10 to 15 bucks. So it's already way cheaper than that. And that's hard to argue on the layer one side because the layer one side is pretty, you know, and up on par with that but if we start talking you're like a hundredth of the price this starts to get really attractive to a lot of people right and you not need most people aren't doing like a hundred transactions a day or something like that so if you're talking maybe you do 20 transactions a week what that's a dollar a week in transaction fees i mean that's amazing so huge props to these teams that are you know pushing forward here and I mean, the other thing is you and I just have talked about this for a while. If anybody listened, they would know that the alt layer one wars were just so stupid. And we've seen a lot of those coins come, you know, 70, 75, 80% off the tops. And I mean, what narrative do they even have anymore, especially as we're pushing forward on all of this layer two innovation and fees are coming down, right? And apps are over there. I mean, these, these layer twos are cheaper than the alt layer ones, which have, you know, state growth problems and, you know, no real innovation behind them. So I mean, I can't even imagine these alt layer one graphs recover, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is we've, we've talked about this for ages. It's like these alt L ones, especially just the EVM ones, they are not ever going to be um, as kind of like secure, decentralized, cheap and healthy long term as L2s are going to be. And I mean, even at this stage, like it's funny, some of them, the, the fees on them are just going up. Like I, I think on, on Phantom, when it was really popular, the fees were going nuts. Avalanche was the same thing on their, on their kind of like EVM chain there. It's all the same thing. Whereas L2s are getting better, cheaper, faster, more secure over time. So yeah, I mean, it's just hilarious to see exactly what we were talking about play out just so cleanly. It's not even like it's different to how we said it was going to play out. It's playing out exactly as we, were, we said. And I really do think that there's not room for, for many of these L1s anymore. I think that there, there might, might be some that have like a massive war chest marketing budget behind them that will keep them going for quite a while. And maybe they even just like pivot to, to being kind of like a roll-up centric roadmap like Ethereum, um, you know, some of them already have, but I, I do think most of them are just going to completely fail, go by the wayside and no one's going to use them because why would you when you can use layer twos on Ethereum uh, and you can get like the Ethereum level security at the end of the day. Like we've always said this and just seeing it come, come to life is actually quite wild. Not to toot our own horn, but we've been right a lot as long as people had patience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, that's the funny thing. Like, it, it it took longer than we expected, but I definitely think we've hit a lot uh, over the years on the head. So, yeah, I guess yeah. kudos to us. <laughs> <laughs> we can pat ourselves on the back every once in a while. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, all right. On to the next update. So, Immutable has announced that they've raised a two hundred million dollar Series C at a two point five billion dollar valuation. 
Obviously a massive raise here. Uh, funny to see that they're still raising given that they have a liquid token. Now, I don't know if this was a raise that was done for the for the token or for the company. I think it was for the company, like equity in the immutable kind of like company here, which would make more sense. Obviously, as I said, they've got a liquid token there. They probably have like a separate cap table for the token and for the company, which is going to be interesting as, as time goes on. Um, it goes on here. But I mean, it's crazy how high these valuations are getting these days, but it makes sense for layer twos, right? I mean, I saw a, a kind of like a, a rumor that Starkware is currently raising around at a $6 billion valuation. This would be Starkware Series D. A lot of the other L2s have raised at $1 billion plus valuations recently or, or are in the process of raising at that. So I, I think that the... Um, the money is out there for these L2s. I think that uh, the the demand for this sort of stuff is is insane. Like, if, if, you, if you think about like what an L2 is, right? It's basically more block space. Now, what is the one thing in crypto that you can be sure has product market fit? Block space, because block space demand is infinite. You know, everything needs block space. So you, you and this is why these valuations are so high is because people realize that, wow, okay, you know, L2 block space is already, already has amazing product market fit. It's only gonna get better over time. Time. Uh, these things have the smartest people working on them. There's so much innovation happening here, and that's why there's these massive raises. And now, in Immutable's case, it's even it, it's kind of like a two prong thing where not only are they kind of like a scalability solution on Ethereum, but they're also targeting the NFT market, which is obviously you know huge right now. But people think it's only going to get bigger over time. So. I think that the valuation uh, may, may be justified. I don't know. Maybe maybe Immutable has a lot of things happening in the background as well. And a lot of people they're onboarding. They've already onboarded a lot of major brands. You know, they onboarded GameStop and a bunch of others out there as, as, as kind of as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, congrats to them on the raise here. It's, 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 it's an awesome raise. I wonder if they're going to go to a Series D or E and if they go public. You know, I, I wonder if they're going to have like a publicly traded uh, stock and also a token and how that kind of like plays off each other. Maybe they will. You know, that, that, that's an interesting thing to think about for sure. But yeah, massive raise. I expect to see, you know, L2s continue to raise like this uh, and continue to kind of like raise at massive valuations as well. Yeah, this was a funny one because the, you know, the token was down, I think at like a, around a dollar, dollar 15, something like that. And all of a sudden it spiked like 30%. I was like, what? That seems weird. And it like reacted like stocks do when they say they're going to get like acquired and it basically says, says what price they're going to get acquired and say the stock was trading like 50, it like pumped to like 65. It just like pumped to that valuation number, right? So it was like trading below where the Series C raise was. So it, very interesting, like you were saying, to see like this raise happen with a token out there, the company company versus the token. I would like to see, you know, more crypto companies like legit crypto companies go public, right? Like I think Coinbase going public was good for the space. Just to kind of get like look, there's still like very very traditional finance people, which I get and it's fine. Like not everyone's going to be like us and wanting just like tokens and token valuations. Like you know, getting our feet in the water in the traditional side and getting valuations over there, I think is still valuable. Now, it might be a while till we see like a layer two like this, like, you know, go live on the stock market, but it's not like too crazy to think about. I mean, we see like a lot of like really shitty IPOs in the tech space. Like these layer twos, like immutable, in my opinion, are like light years ahead in innovation and, and potential for the future, right? So I'm sure there would be some smart people salivating to get in on this and some people that maybe don't mess around with buying tokens. I don't think you can buy like immutable on like coinbase yet and stuff i could i could definitely be wrong about that i'm not sure where it's being traded but anyways props to the immutable team i i still think nfts just have to go to layer two like it, even like punks i get why they'll probably stay on layer one forever essentially maybe they'll have like a bridge over to layer two for some people at some point but it still infuriates me to have to pay a 40 dollar fee just to change the listing price on a punk right like NFTs on layer two are essential, especially when it comes to gaming and stuff like that. So, I mean, Immutable is not going to be the only player in the game forever, but I, they're they're going to be huge. They're already, you know, a bit ahead of the game. And, you know, NFT layer two, gaming layer two, that's where that's where layer two innovation is really going to take off. Or not innovation, adoption is really going to take off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It definitely will. Uh, I think, you know, uh, right now, I guess NFTs are in a little bit of a maybe bear market or something like that, but they'll come back. Uh, I, I think that uh, they've surprised people enough times now to, to kind of like, uh, you know, see that they'll come back. 
All right, on to the next update, which is quite a large one. So the Kiln Merge testnet is now live. So this will be the last major testnet for the merge before we get a solid mainnet window out of this. Now that is given uh, that that is kind of like um, dependent on there being no major issues with this merge testnet. Uh, it you know it seems to have gone well so far, but if there are uh, yeah, if there are major issues that need to be kind of be revised and changed, obviously we'll have another testnet here. But this is the last one before we start forking the kind of like testnets of Gurley and Robston and stuff like that, uh, which should come relatively relatively soon. Now, I'm still expecting the merge to happen in June. I give it a greater than 50% chance at this, at this point in time. But as I said, that can change given the fact that there could be major bugs or anything like that. Or for any reason, basically, that the researchers and developers kind of like feel that it needs to be pushed back. But remember, there's also the difficulty bomb that's kind of like happening uh, in June or starting to happen in June. And we're going to need to hard fork regardless of the merge or not. So, uh, you know, if it just gets to a point where the researchers and developers are not confident at all in a, in a kind of a June or maybe even July merge, then we're going to have to basically uh, do a separate hard fork to push back the, the difficulty bomb uh, and, you know, then kind of like do the merge after that. So we'll have to see how that, that kind of like plays out. Out, but you can get involved in the Kiln Merge Testnet if you would like to. There are guides for that. I'm pretty sure Tim Biker links to them. If you go to his Twitter profile, you'll be able to see that there. And there's probably a link to it in the in the in the kind of like newsletter as well there. So so yeah, cool to see this. Uh, very very exciting. I hope that everything goes well so that we do get that June merge uh, merge on Mainnet because that's going to be a very very big day. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I know I've we've said it a lot, but I mean, this is like to me, the biggest day in Ethereum's history, and we're like sneaking up on it. I mean, like you said, it could change. I mean, it seems like June's a good target, but you know, stuff always happens, but we're talking like three months away, right? Like it's, it's no longer far away. And this will be, I mean, historic day. It'll also be, I mean, so many like different emotions, I guess, but a stressful day too, just cause like, this is like a real, like change over for the the heart of the network you're essentially like replacing the heart of the network if you want to put it that way um you know and i have all the faith in the world and the, the teams that have done this and you know in the past we've done like phase zero and all the major changes ethereum's made and everything's gone relatively smoothly um but this is going to be a fun one it's it's going to be one where you're like not only watching you know, the days leading into it and when it happens, but for multiple days after to just kind of monitor everything. And, you know, I, I'm as a staker, selfishly, I'm going to be watching mostly like the fees coming in, the MEV I can take in. And I think it's going to blow people away. I, I believe the APY that people are going to be able to take in as a staker. And I, I think, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about layer two, of course, and because we've talked a lot about it, the merge in the past, and now it just has this date, we're kind of just like waiting to get there. Um, but this could be a bullish catalyst for ETH. If all of a sudden you're like, hey, look, stakers are earning 20%. And then when they were earning 5% before the merge or a little less, um, hey, you can buy this, you know, now proven not, it's still speculative, but way more proven than it was in the past. Um, they've proved that they can switch to proof of stake. You no longer have like the environmental si um, concern side. The major change has happened. Um, risk has slowly come off and you can earn this crazy yield on your asset. I mean, this is like, uh, it's a hyper bullish case, right? And then you mix in the layer two side of things. Um, you know, I, I never really like claiming I know where graphs are going because I don't. Um, we could be at $200 ETH for all I know by the time the merge happens. But if I was a betting man, um, after months of consolidation, this seems like a pretty good catalyst target, much like phase zero was for the next push up on E. So we'll see. Yeah. And the funny thing is, if people will remember, ETH was around 600 bucks when the Beacon Chain went live. And obviously, it went up massively from there to 4,400, came back down, you know, settled around where we are today. Uh, but like in relation to that, we now have uh, 10 million ETH staked as well. That's something of note, uh, over 10 million ETH staked. And, you know, withdrawals aren't going to be enabled on of staked ETH until I think Q1 2023 at this stage as part of the Shanghai network upgrade, which is the first upgrade after, after the merge. So I think... You know, when you kind of like look at all of this and look at how much ETH is probably going to get staked due to what you were saying, Eric, about those kind of APYs going up due to the fee revenue and the MEV and stuff like that, we're going to see like a pretty big ETH supply shock, I think. And that's why I, I say things like the merge isn't priced in, you know, there's an 80 to 90% issuance reduction coming and then 
basically there's a dead period of at least six months where no new ETH that's being issued is going to be able to enter the market because of the fact that there's no withdrawals of staked ETH. Um, and, and then, you know, there's going to be more and more ETH getting staked over time. And, you know, there's this, and the funny thing is there's this narrative going around right now that when the merge happens, all that 10 million ETH is getting unlocked. That's not how it works at all. And it's actually, you know, really frustrating to see that people believe this because it's just hilariously wrong. Like, as I said, there are no withdrawals until the Shanghai network upgrade. But even when withdrawals are enabled, there is a limit to how much ETH can be withdrawn uh, a day, which is around, I think, 30,000 ETH a day. And it's based on the amount of validators that can be exited per day. So even in the worst case where 30,000 ETH is being um, kind of like withdrawn each day, uh, you have to basically take into account how much more new ETH is going into staking each day as well. Uh, kind of like, you know, if that ETH getting unstaked is actually going to exchanges to be sold. And you kind of like do the math from there and see kind of what the actual sell pressure is. But honestly, I think a lot of ETH that's being staked is is definitely uh, from from a lot of whales who are forever stakers. You know, it doesn't seem like they want to want to necessarily sell or anything like that. But we're going to have to see how that shakes out. But yeah, I mean, as I said, like there's no withdrawals at the merge, uh, and then there is a limit on how much they can be withdrawn once withdrawals are put in place. So I don't think that uh, it's a, it's a bearish catalyst for ETH at all. I think it's a really really bullish catalyst for ETH at the merge, and then everything following that. That that's for sure. All right, last two updates to get through. It's quick ones here. So Nethermind has uh, the Ethereum core client has released their full pruning implementation. Now, for those of you who don't know what this is, it basically, uh, there there is pruning already within kind of like Ethereum nodes. So when you run an Ethereum full node in pruned mode, it means that you're basically just discarding all the historical state, but you're still running an Ethereum full node. You can still have guarantees uh, based on kind of like, uh, um, I guess the way that the kind of like implementation works that you're, you know, you're, you're still on the, the, the right chain the head of the chain and everything like that but the way that geth currently does it is that if whenever you want to prune your kind of like database you need to take your node offline uh and obviously that is not ideal because you want your full node to be online all the time so what nethermind does is it allows you to keep your full node running while doing pruning so a prune node is, is about 100 gig i believe today a prune full node um whereas like a full archive node is like over 10 terabytes at this at this part so obviously pruning is needed here but this is a huge kind of like release from nethermind i mean they're just killing the game lately they're doing a bunch of other stuff as well they're building st tools for starkware and things like that but this is an absolutely massive release from them and will help people that kind of i guess like a hard drive or solid state drive i should say uh space constrained there and also you know for syncing things and stuff like that you definitely don't want to have to sync like terabytes of information to sync a full node so yeah this is a huge kind of like release from nethermind i just wanted to give a shout out to them there on, on, on achieving this i think this is going to be big going forward and it's going to allow for more scalability at the base layer as well if we can do kind of like uh you know pruning in 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 kind of like simultaneously to the node running you know you don't have to take the node offline i think that's a pretty big achievement here yeah, it's a huge step. It's just amazing how many, you know, teams are working on so many different important aspects on Ethereum. I mean, huge props to the Nethermind team. I feel like they were a team that kind of came out of nowhere, I would say, what, two years ago? Maybe a little over. Like, I don't mean that as like a bad thing coming out of nowhere, but like, it was just like, well, Parity and Gath at a point and then Gath and like Nethermind kind of like snuck up. And I feel like they've been doing really like sneaky, awesome things. Um, and this is one of them. And yeah, just kind of pushing the envelope forward in many different areas. I mean, and running an ETH1 node is still really important. Unfortunately, my my ETH1 node kind of shot craps the other day. I had a DAP node, um, like a Vado system and the, the SSD went, shot craps and I got a new one and that one was bad. And I just haven't got back to it. So I've unfortunately had my ETH1 node offline for a little while now. Um, luckily my ETH2 nodes are up, but what's funny about that is I'm economically incentivized to run my ETH2 nodes. So maybe there's something to that concept, right? Um, if those went down, I would figure it out quickly. But um, yeah, just props to the Nethermind team and I guess anybody that's running ETH1 nodes still out there. Yeah, and if you're not and, and you're able to, definitely run an ETH1 node. Uh, like it helps the network, it helps you. You can put your MetaMask to it obviously we had a bit of drama over the last few weeks uh, which we didn't actually talk about maybe we should briefly mention that how Infura uh, made a config change uh, apparently accidentally and they started barring users from certain countries. I think it was Venezuela. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Infura is just like an infrastructure provider that acts as like a transaction relayer. Now, when you install MetaMask, the default provider is, is Infura. So whenever you send a transaction, it's actually relaying via Infura's infrastructure and they can censor you like, and they can block you very easily. So if you are running your own full node, you can actually point your MetaMask RPC to that full node and you have full self-sovereign 
sovereign kind of like bankless control over your transactions and no one can censor you in that case. So I think uh, in, the, in that kind of like, uh, in that case, uh, you should definitely be running your own full node if you're able to. And as a bonus point, your MetaMask, uh, uh, you know, RPC to that full node in order to get kind of like full censorship resistance uh, capabilities from Ethereum there. All right, on to uh, the last update here, which is Argent's Layer 2 features are now available to everyone. This was in closed beta for a little while, but now everyone can use their integration with ZK Sync uh, to basically seamlessly do a bunch of stuff on Layer 2, such as you know buying staked ETH, buying kind of like ST ETH or R ETH and things like that. And they've actually got a very seamless integration where they've got Fiat on ramps too. So you can essentially go from uh, Fiat in a bank account to uh, I guess like ETH or some other token on a Layer t on, on on Argent, and then basically trade it on ZK Sync, uh, which is really, really cool. I mean, this is, as I was saying, you know, earlier, as we were saying earlier about mass adoption and the Opera integration with Diversify, this is what we need. These very, very seamless things where people can just go straight from fiat to crypto and start earning a yield and or something like that, right on their dollars or their ETH or anything like that. So very cool to see that Argent's Layer 2 features are now uh, kind of like live for everyone. They're starting with ZK Sync, but they've already announced support for Starkware and they're also going to be supporting other Layer 2s as well, I believe. So uh, this is, you know, just really, really cool cool to see. I hope people have given this a shot. You know, Argent's a mobile wallet app, so you can just download it, create a wallet on there and, and get started with their with their kind of like layer two integration here. Yeah, I mean, Argent's always been a huge innovator, right, on the wallet side of things and then just kind of rent. I mean, I still think, I mean, they're a smart contract wallet, right? And everybody that's been listening to this show for years knows that I'm, and I know you are as well, bullish long-term smart contract wallets. And smart contract wallets just kind of ran into issues on layer one when, once fees got high, right? Because every transaction you do, it's it's a smart contract. It's not an EOA. So it's a little more costly, right? And now they enabled you to do amazing things like social recovery and direct integrations into apps and like all kinds of stuff, which is the future, but they struggled on layer one. And now that layer two is here, I think Argent, you know, I know Gnosis as well, other smart contract wallets are going to flourish. And I'm a huge fan of the Argent team and things they've been doing. Um, you know, I, I think seamless onboarding from fiat into wallets. And then like we were saying that just like great UX for layer two and just making Ethereum feel natural, make it feel like even better than your favorite like banking app or Venmo or PayPal. Like I think we can easily get there. We're getting there and teams like Argent are going to push us there. I have no doubt about that. Yep, I have no doubt either about all of that. It's going to be cool to see how that plays out over the next few years. All right, so I think that's it for this week, everyone. Uh, thank you again for listening. If you want to check out everything we talked about, you can go to the newsletter, which is at ethub.substack.com. The podcast is at podcast.ethub.io. And we'll hopefully catch you all next week and won't go three weeks between podcasts again. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to Into the Ether. You can subscribe to the podcast and newsletter at ethub.substack.com, find our website at ethub.io, and follow us on Twitter at, at econoar and at sassel0x.